Are the Rams another Dream Team Eagles? Mm. The 2011 Eagles, that was the... Uh, Vince Young quote. Yeah. That Dream, was the year... Dream Team. <laughs> that was the year that... Um, Dream Team. <laughs> that... Uh, Pretty good, right? <laughs> that was the year of the lockout. And... That was a lot. That was a very good reaction, Pete. Thanks. I mean, look, I, I was. That try- was the year of the lockout. I was trying to get your reaction to my impersonation. I gave it of to you. I played the exact same thing. Right. Dream team. But it sounded pretty good. Uh, that Gotta was add the, the laugh. That was the year of the lockout when mm-hmm. the Eagles had to put the dream team together. They they just quickly in free agency started compiling Namdi Asawa, Dominic Rogers, Cromarty, you know Vince Young, and they went out and got all these guys. And uh, there's an article at ESPN.com I was reading this morning that talks about are the Rams another dream team? And I was kind of thinking about that. You know, you know they went out and added a lot of guys, but this was a team that's been really bad for a long time. And now last year they popped on the scene, and now they're basically everybody's pick to be a Super Bowl contender. Sure. Is there anything, John, that would concern you about the Rams? Yeah, I, I mean, I I still am not completely believing in Jared Goff yet, uh, or Sean McVay for that matter. Uh, I I've said before, I'm not sure if what he did last season, Sean McVay kind of turned it into a, a check with me college like offense. I'm not sure that works long term in the NFL. It's a little little gimmicky. Uh, so I, I still have to see that and and how it goes forward. Uh, perhaps uh, as Goff continues to learn more uh, about progressions and things like that, maybe he he lets up on the reins a little bit and and they improve. But until I see it, I, I don't know if if that way of offense is going to work long term. There's going to be adjustments made. Uh, this league, I, everybody calls it a copycat league. I always say it is. There's no question about that but it's a slow-moving copycat league. It's really, really slow. And when you get to the off season, and that's when everybody's picking apart the film, the tape, uh, and they see what you're doing, that's when the major adjustments are made. So I, I want to see how that offense looks. But defensively, with Wade Phillips and all the talent and adding and Dominic and Sue and Marcus Peters and Aqib Tlaib, uh, that's going to be a really good defense. John, you talked about Jared Goff and how much that was a check with me kind of situation with him and Sean McVay. Uh, do you believe that Jared Goff has the ability to read defenses or was he relying too much on Sean McVay? Like, uh, you do the reading, I'll do the throwing. Well, there's no question. I mean, that's how it was set up. Uh, and and that's where he was. I mean, remember where he came from. Uh, and, and Cal, and they played that bear rate offense. So it was pretty much one read and go. Uh, and that's a lot of the difficulty that young quarterbacks have. One of the reasons the Eagles fell in love with Carson Wentz is because of the style of offense he played in college. It was more of a pro style, and he sort of had a leg up on, on all those things we think about traditional NFL quarterbacks doing. Turns out they were probably right. Uh, so I don't know if he has that ability. But he's going to have to get to that ability if he wants to be a true superstar. I, I don't think I don't think a check with me offense at this level is going to work long term. I just don't. Yeah, you know, one thing is with Goff, the first year he had Fisher. Then he gets, uh, you know, obviously the new coach, McVay. McVay mm-hmm. And now he's into his second year with McVay. We should learn a lot about him because I think we're finding out a lot of times, you know, that was always the built-in excuse for Bradford was, well, he never had the same offensive coordinator, you know, two years in a row. And, of course, he's going to have a different one again now. That how stabilizing that position means, you know, what that means for these guys. And we might even see how it infiltrates here in Philly, although to a lesser degree because Peterson calls the place. Yeah, and, and you're right about, you know, there was a huge – and Sean McVay de- deserves a lot of credit. I'm not trying to say – he doesn't. But what happened is Jeff Fisher is a defensive-minded coach, a traditionalist, old-school guy. Rob Horst was the offensive coordinator. His background is an offensive line coach. So it wasn't great people to have around a young quarterback, especially a raw young quarterback. And they kind of 
when he did get in there, that kind of threw him to the wolves and did things like a traditional NFL offense. And he wasn't ready for it. And he looked awful. So that's what Sean McVay did, and he just deserves credit, similar to what John Filippo and Frank Reich and Doug Peterson did here after Carson got hurt and went to Nick Foles and said, what are you comfortable doing, and sort of revamped the entire offense uh, as we headed into the playoffs and the Super Bowl run for the Eagles. Sean McVay knew Jared Goff wasn't ready to do what they were asking him to do. He scaled it back, and it worked uh, to a significant level. Playoff team, very good team. I'm just saying you have to take that next step. It's not to say he doesn't recognize it. I I think he's a a tremendous offensive mind, and ultimately I think he will recognize that, and and he will slowly bring him along incrementally. But I, I think there's still a lot of improvement that has to come along with Jared Goff. And, John, is that the biggest difference between when you look at that Eagles team that Vince Young uttered that statement about and this Rams team, the fact that, you know, there was a 130-day lockout in 2011 where there was no interaction between players and coaches. The Rams don't have that problem. If anything, they have McVay more comfortable in his second year and Goff as a third-year quarterback and uh, Wade Phillips continuing to call a defense that they know what his expectations are. If anything, they're more comfortable uh, than the Eagles team that they scrambled to put together that year. Yeah, and, and more than that, there's been no change in the structure of how the league is run. Remember all the changes as far as practicing and all the scale backs and, and the number of padded practices that we always talk about. Uh, there was no off-season work anyway, but even in-season. Uh, this was all new for coaches, so it was uncharted territory. So that was one of the under-reported things of that year for everybody is what coaching staff looked at the new rules and took advantage of them the best. Now, typically, Andy Reid was always one of the most prepared coaches in football. So ultimately, I don't think that was necessarily it uh, in Philadelphia. But also, you know, when you look back at people calling the dream team and Vince Young coining that phrase, well, Vince Young was a backup quarterback. I mean, what, we're talking about all pros in Indomitian Sioux and Aqib Tlaib and Marcus Peters. This is not Dominic Rogers Crow Marty. This is these are truly, truly star players that the Rams brought in. That that team, by the way, the Eagles team, uh, I think they finished five hundred. Like they got off to a terrible start. They actually got better as that year went on. Like they finished pretty strong. And I remember like them going into the next year, which I think was a total disaster, ended up getting Reed fired. Right. Right. They went four and twelve that year. But that the next year they had all those injuries across the offensive line and McCoy got hurt and uh uh, Jackson got it. I mean, they had injury there, but the team, the dream team team, got off to a bad start. They started four and eight, right? And then they finished eight and eight, right? But they missed the playoffs, right? But they 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 started ripping like wins off at the end, and that kind of made people feel like that almost saved Andy Reid's job. We think like he might have got fired the year before had they not ripped off those four wins. If you go back to that, yeah, I, I mean, and and it started started to be at the end, and I often talk about Andy's. Uh, personal problems, his family problems. I think that had a lot to do with his ultimate demise here. Uh, And then you have the shelf life aspect of it uh, and the fact that uh, I think everybody has a shelf life and at some point people see me have these guys with reputations, but they weren't necessarily uh, really good players at that stage of their careers. They had big names. Asamoah was probably the one where you would say, well, look, he was a really good player. He should have done better here. But even him, I I, I mean, at that stage uh, of his career, was he as good as Marcus Peters or Aqib Tlaib? And Dominican Sue might be better than both of them. I mean, he's got his own issues as far as off-the-field stuff and penalties and kind of losing his cool at times. But nobody's going to question that guy's talent uh, as far as being a a star player in this league. Uh, So I, I think... Part of it was the people they brought in were just overrated, and they really weren't that good. So, John, is the number one lesson that the Rams can learn from that Eagles team in 2011, stay quiet, stay humble? I mean, it seems like an obvious message, but yet clearly this is a takeaway that people had from that Eagles team is, uh, you know, don't go tooting your own horn. 
Yeah, and, and certainly if you're the backup quarterback, <laughs> don't, go, don't go saying dream team or, or a backup quarterback. Uh, and, and that's for everybody. But I, I think the Rams would like – I mean, there's been teams, most notably would be Denver, uh, when they brought in DeMarcus Ware and, and, and Tlaib, same player, and T.J. Ward. Hey, work for them. Uh, and even a couple years ago, not to the Super Bowl level, but you saw that turnaround uh, the New York Giants made when they had the worst defense in the history of football, uh, and they turned it around in one year by bringing in big names and free agency that turned out to be good players. Uh, uh, jo- so it can work as well. Yeah, John McMullen is with us here at JF McMullen on Twitter. Um uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer writing that uh, Baker Mayfield did, quote, did not look ready to compete with Tyrod Taylor for the Browns' starting quarterback position. Now, I think that's fine with them, right? You bring Taylor in, you want him to be the guy, but um, I guess it's the first clue of many people who criticized that pick, saying, see, I told you this guy wasn't the best quarterback number one overall. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not necessarily going to, jump off a bridge i'm one of those who think they should have taken sam darnold but uh you know if you like the quarterback you got to show the courage of your convictions i have no problem with them taking baker mayfield and it doesn't surprise me that a a rookie in his first sort of spring doesn't look as good as a veteran who's done it uh time and time again and there's one thing about Tyrod Taylor. The guy just doesn't make mistakes. His issues are, you know, the big plays aren't there. Uh, and, and you know, but from the Browns' perspective, that's a huge upgrade to have a quarterback who's going to be out there and not make a ton of mistakes. So uh, they have some time. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think they have to force and, and, and push Mayfield out there week one because Taylor's going to be competent. And that's something competency they haven't had at that position for years and years and years. So, but I, I ultimately, if he doesn't turn out to be a star in this league, Baker Mayfield, obviously, they, they're going to be haunted for years and years and years by passing on Carson Wentz. And no Watson. no doubt. No doubt about that, that. That there were so many quarterbacks. And look, in the Rams uh, Eagle situation, it was really just those two. At the top, and this one, there was a lot of choices, and many people thought they went with one of the lower of the, what, five choices. Yeah, I mean, you go to the next year, they really had, they could have picked anybody. So uh, let's say Patrick Mahomes takes uh, takes off in Kansas City this season, because uh, uh, that'll be part of the narrative as well. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky in Chicago. Uh, I'm not as high on him as some people are, but if he does take off, he's he's in that category. It wasn't just Wentz and, and Watson. They kept saying, looking at quarterbacks and saying, this is not the guy, this is not the guy, this is not the guy, this is not the guy. And, and remember, it's a different <laughs> regime, John. That's not, that's not John Dorsey's fault. Uh, he didn't pass on all those guys. And I, I, I would bet my, uh, you know, anything that he would have taken Wentz and, and, and if he were there. Right. But he wasn't, and, and this is what he inherited. And, and uh, as for the franchise as a whole, they're going to have a difficult time overcoming that if, unless Mayfield turns into a star. Uh, a lot of off-season stuff with these guys. You know, um, any thoughts in Atlanta that there's a rocky uh, relationship between Julio Jones and the, and the Falcons? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, he, he seems like one of those guys that's kind of quiet. I mean, he's like the Kawhi Leonard, you know, almost of wide receivers. Like, I don't know that I've ever heard Julio Jones. But remember, he changed all his social media stuff, and people were freaking out. Yeah, right. But I don't think I've yeah. ever heard him in an interview. Like, I don't. You never hear him say to, he doesn't seem like he's the diva ish wide receiver. He's just one of those professionals. He always gets it done. And now all of a sudden, he, he he's like Kawhi Leonard out there. Yeah, I mean, he's not the the typical diva receiver, as you mentioned. This is probably the most diva thing he did, and that's working out with Terrell Owens. So that <laughs> kind of that 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 kind of got sort of the the radar up for the Falcons. Not not so much because 
he missed off season work because this is a star player. He doesn't need it. Four straight fourteen hundred yard seasons. If he's not the best receiver in football, he's probably number two behind Antonio Brown. So I, I, he he's a true superstar, and he always has been a, a quiet guy. He just works hard, just does his job. But it's similar to Earl Thomas, similar to some of the old uh, other holdouts you saw this this spring uh, when he signed his deal, it was huge, and now people are passing him. So he wants to be paid uh, like the number two receiver. All his guaranteed money is essentially gone. Uh, and, and it was a lot of it. I think he was 35, something around that range, million. So now it's, you know, the average of his contract is about 14-something million, which is still top 10. But in real money, he's only making about 10 or 11 per year because all that guaranteed money has already been front-loaded, already gone. So he wants to tweak his deal, and that's ultimately I think they they get it done uh, because he is who he is, and the Falcons right. know they need him. But, yeah, I mean, Pete mentioned the social media stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's working out with T.O. The one good thing is Matt Ryan always gets the receivers together in Florida, and, and he says Julio's going to be there on their own. So – I think that's a positive development. John, how about the report out there that the Patriots were shopping Gronk to teams they trust? What do you take of that, or what do you make of that? What does that even mean, teams they trust? (laughs) Teams they trust with with GMs or or personnel people that used to work in New England, so basically half the league. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Yeah, I I mean, it it, it went – if you go all the way back to the Super Bowl, that's sort of when – the the story came out and and Bill Belichick did play Malcolm Butler and all that and and what was behind it and there was the kind of sense that he's getting tired of this generation of players and 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 I think Gronk's Gronk's quote about going to off season work was something like no I I got to work on my dirt bike racing or something that <laughs> it and. Obviously, Belichick didn't like that, and they supposedly made some calls to the teams uh, that do have Patriots people, Detroit, Tennessee, teams like that, uh, and and, and kind of at least took the temperature of what they could get back. I, I, I believe that because Gronk is a tough guy to deal with. I, I mean, you, you've seen some of the, his annex uh, in the offseason, the partying, it, the dirt biking, he wants to be a, a Hollywood action star, uh, the wrestling stuff. You know, Bill would prefer guys that just want to work on football, but he he's the best tight end maybe we've ever seen, so he can get away with some of that stuff. John McMullen with us, so I'll ask you about a former Patriot turned Colt, a guy that's 45 years old and says he just wants to keep on kicking. That's Adam Vinatieri. You know my love of the kickers, John, and it looks like he could uh, break some records this season. Yeah, I mean, that guy's been around for so long. He's been so good. He's been and and so many big kicks and big games and clutch kicks. Uh, it's one of those things. Obviously, it's a position uh, that lends itself to, uh, to you playing late in, in – your athletic career, if you go all the way back to George Blanda, uh, he was probably the oldest player ever. Uh, and and look, if anybody can do it, he can do it. At some point, you see guys are, are, are so strong, and, and, and we, we have one here in Philadelphia, and Jake Elliott, his mm-hmm. leg strength is just ridiculous. And then you go down I-95 and see Justin Tucker in Baltimore, these guys kick 53, 54 yard field goals like it's nothing. And you wonder if he can keep up in that environment. But to date, he has. So, uh, I mean, if he continues to kick the way he's been kicking, there's no no need to replace him. I am banning kicking questions for the rest of the summer. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's that's my, my putting my foot down on that. No more kicking questions the rest of the summer. Uh, John McMullen appeared via the Boardwalk Hada hotline talking some NFL. Don't forget, give him a follow at JF McMullen and check out his national column at GetMoreSports.com. His uh, column on the Eagles right now uh, at uh, 97.3 ESPN.com has the rookie report card. 
Check out what John saw from the Eagle rookies at the offseason OTAs. Post it right now at 97.3ESPN.com. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys.